Hello and welcome to week five in our research methods class. And we have actually two chapters to cover this week. So uh, a little bit of uh, heavier content than we're used to. If we look at the um, course timeline here in Brightspace, we see that in week five, we have chapter four using the scientific method, chapter five, variables in measurement. And, you, and you'll understand that this is, a lot of this is review. I mean, you've been exposed to the uh, scientific method and we talked about variables and measurement in statistics. And um, so this is review, but it's still important to kind of go through these things. And particularly as you're starting to look at the study that you're going to replicate to kind of see how that particular study applied the scientific method, the methodologies that it used for its particular research, and then of course, how do they define their variables so that we can look at defining them in the same way when we replicate that study. So let's dive right into the, um, into the course book here. Get that ready and chapter four. And I'm gonna go through this really quickly because I, I really wanna spend a lot more time, but I want uh, a lot more time in class going over this, please come to the class with questions about these. You know, if there's anything, you know, you've watched this video, you have um, read the material and off we go. So of course, the, the scientific method is a, is a mechanism by which we discipline the way we observe the world. And we, that discipline is the psychological discipline, which is a science and the method of science is the scientific method. And so it limits our focus. In, in psychology, we were just talking about, uh, intro to psych, we're talking this week about sensation and perception. And we know that the eye and the ear actually narrow what we actually experience based on all the, let's say all the, all the electromagnetic um, wavelengths that are there. There's just a small part that, in, that is included in human vision. We don't see ultraviolet. We don't see, you know, the, the, different, uh, the different wavelengths. In a similar way, the scientific method disciplines us to approach the study of variables in a particular way, in a discipline that reduces error, that provides uh, a mathematical determination of validity, reliability, and significance. And these things all come together so that when you read an article that's been done in the scientific method, you can go, you can kind of hang your hat on it a little bit more than, you know, the YouTube video. The, unless it's my YouTube video, you can hang your hat on that. But, you know, a YouTube video or a blog or somebody posts something on Facebook, that's just not the scientific method. And there's a lot of stuff obviously going around that has never really even been tested by the scientific method. So we have this discipline of how we observe the world. We're gonna look at uh, different ways to observe the world. Those are our research methods. Um, the different goals of designs. What are we trying to get from those designs? Uh, our goals might, or hypotheses and goals might be different. And uh, connect ways to observe behavior with research designs that they came to. So if we're looking at particular kinds of behavior, that defines the methods that we're gonna be looking at. So first, we observe, and that discipline is our methods. Let's quickly go through here. We want to have these three aspects need to are very front and center in terms of how we do our design. Uh, two aspects of validity, external validity, internal validity, and of course, reliability. Ultimately, the heart and soul of psychology is that the constructs that we're, that we're observing and the methods that we observe those constructs with and the methodology that we use can be done again. It can be repeated. So repeated studies give a firm or they may more, maybe they destroy the, the, the um, results that somebody came up with. So maybe someone came up with significant results and another study comes along and finds out that it's, drop my microphone here, and finds out it's really not that significant and we have a nice little argument happening in the literature so validity has to do is it real is the construct you're studying real and the tool that you're using to measure it does it really measure that construct now external validity is 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 happens when you have another tool 
that's out there, another instrument that measures the same construct, or there's a definition of that construct that's out there that's already accepted in the world, and yours correlates with that. You know, let's say, um, let's say you have two intelligence tests, and they both predict how well, and, and you know, the, the one that's been around for a long time predicts how well people in, do in school. Now the scores on that test, I create another test, and if my test correlates with the scores on that test, then by definition of the relationship between correlations, I can use that test to predict how well people are gonna do in school, because that's what that does. So you have an external deter determination of validity. The def I'm using somebody else's definition, I'm using somebody else's test to validate what I'm doing. Internal validity is when you look at your actual instrument and say, does it look right? You know, this is face validity. Does this have face validity? Does it look like it's gonna, is it construct validity? Does it actually measure things that I think make up a person's intelligence or make up their personality? Now in the world, in the history of psychology, People, of course, have created instruments without any sort of external validity to them because they weren't around as we discover new aspects of the human condition. So here we are with a, uh, an instrument that we're creating and we don't know yet as to whether it has any external validity or not because it's too early in the field. Now, over the years, those have been tested in terms of their utility, different theories coming along about personality and whatnot. And you probably recognize um, an aspect of, let's say, personality testing that has resulted from all kinds of tests sort of watering down to what we call the big five. So in trait personality theories, there are literally hundreds of traits and hundreds of personality tests that measure traits. And if we put those all together and we kind of do some statistical analysis, it really comes down to those big five. Those big five always appear. So you see this kind of process of, of validation of what makes up personality. In the big five, what they're looking at are what are the five characteristics that show up, no matter how many characteristics they're measuring, those five are in there. So they say, oh, the big five are really core aspects of the personality that we no, and it's useful information because it has external and internal validity. Now, the reliability part is that your methods can be repeated. It's not a one-off. It's not a unique situation. Those happen. You know, how many astronauts can we actually study? You know, how many, so these are, those are called case studies. Case study as a methodology is often very non-repeatable. You can't replicate a case study because the individual might no, might no longer be there. The individual's older was a snapshot. So that's not a method that lends itself to reliability. Although the questionnaire that you use, you could maybe use with somebody else. The instrument itself might be able to be replicated, but the methodology of actually interviewing that case study is not. So. Reliability looks at replication. Can I exactly replicate the way the individuals did this study? So you're gonna be looking at some studies that were done and you're gonna be looking at that method section and how they actually went through the steps of collecting their data and determining the degree to which you can do that just like they did. And already we know we're gonna diverge from that because of some of the sample sizes you experienced in these articles. But that doesn't say that you can't replicate the study and make some changes, but you're gonna note those. You're gonna say, yes, I'm replicating this study, but this group that, you know, the original study did this on a paper and pencil test, inviting people into the lab. I'm gonna be doing it through a digital test, inviting people from the internet. That's a methodological change that reduces the reliability of the instrument but it's still okay to do. You just, have to, you just have to recognize it and validate it. Okay, I'm going way too slow here. So let's, let's go into, we have operational definitions. This is uh, looking at our variables and determining how are we gonna measure them. And then there's data collection techniques. This is your methods. Quickly go through these. Here we have naturalistic observation, watching human beings in their natural environment. That's always fun. 
The food court and the mall are my favorite places to go to do that kind of thing. Surveys and questionnaires, we're going to be examining that. Systematic observations, this is not just casual, naturalistic observation. You're actually at check sheets, you're looking for certain kinds of behavior, a little bit more concrete on there. There's a little movie here about a, uh, a researcher uh, demonstrating um, cognitive development. This is, uh, it's sort of a false natural environment that this little child is, is acting in, and she's actually systemically, well, in the bigger study that supports this video, she systematically exposes the same kids to the same experiment and observes their natural behavior in that environment. So, cool, cool study too on, on Piaget's uh, symbolic reasoning and development. Then we use archival data. You're looking at existing data that's already out there. Case studies, again, you know, with an example of uh, Anna O, oh, who was, uh, name was actually Bertha, and one of Freud's first case studies. And then we look at correlation studies. And we're, we're, so here's these methodologies, and then this is sort of like, well, what do we do with these numbers? Do we, the first off, of course, recognizing you already know that correlations look for a relationship, but that relationship is not necessarily cause effect. That's what we need experiments for. But if there's no correlation between something, there's no cause effect. So you have to determine the correlation first. So if you're trying to see, um, you know, you have an intervention in your classroom, let's say, that, that raises test scores, so you do that and the scores go up. Okay, the scores could have gone up for a lot of reasons, but the first we have to determine when I did those methods, did that happen at the same time as the scores going up? And if in, if in fact your correlation determines that yes, they did happen at the same time, you can then move to the next aspect of the study, which is to determine cause and effect. And we start looking at different methodologies at that point in terms of splitting up groups and making sure the samples are equitable and then comparing the group that got it, group that didn't, you know, those kinds of experiments that are looking beyond correlation and actually looking for cause and effect. So correlations first, we look at those, we determine yay or nay on that. We use studies simply for correlation, sometimes in combination with um, our actual experiments. Then we get introduced to this idea of quasi-experiments. Now quasi-experiments, well experiments, have validity and methods when we randomly assign people to the experimental group. So if I'm going to compare students in, uh, you know, some who get a PowerPoint, some who don't, I want to see the effectiveness of PowerPoint on teaching and learning. Ideally, in an experiment, I would take 50 people and I would randomly assign 25 to this group and 25 to this group. However, we're not always able to do that. In a school environment, for example, I can't switch people around. They're in Mrs. Smith's class and one of them is Mr. Hart's class. So you have Mrs. Smith and Mr. Hart's class of 25 students and I'm gonna do the study anyway, recognizing this it's experimental but it didn't involve any random sampling. So therefore, it's quasi-experimental. There may be vast differences between the teachers. There may be vast differences between the classrooms, and I try to recognize those, but I can still do the, do the study as long as I recognize that it's quasi-experimental. Okay? Now, the next one, we get into uh, different kinds of experiments. Here's the... Um, there's an ex post facto design that studies based on groups. And that's kind of what we're just talking about here. Um, groupings of subjects that already exist. So anytime you can't apply randomized sampling, you're into that area of um, quasi experiments. We get into our, we have a ch chapter quiz, lots of questions in that five chapter quiz and then a discussion on the research you have done for your individual research project, discuss the observation and data collection methods you might want to replicate. So this is continuing the discussion about the article you're gonna be replicating. So you, hopefully, by the end of this week, we'll have all these discussions. You can get the actual article and look at its methods and post that in here and get right into the article. How did they actually pull this off? 
Was it quasi-experimental? Did they actually have random? Did, was it convenient sampling? Or they just, like I think many of you, at least, I know at least two of you that I've talked to, you're going to try and get large sample sizes, so you're going to send this out to the world and try and get lots of people to participate in your study. But that's convenient sampling. It's everybody who volunteers who comes in. And you know, people who volunteer may be statistically different than people who don't volunteer. So how do you get to study people who don't volunteer? You know, that's a whole interesting question in the world of science. So we then, uh, we have a chapter four lab that's gonna be in there. So we have the, you know, we have the quiz, the discussion in the lab for chapter four, and we move into chapter five. Variables and measurement. These are those factors that we are looking for relationships in, in between them. You know, does, does wealth predict how well marriage goes? You know, do wealthy people, people who have more wealth, do they have better marriages? So we have two variables that we're measuring. How are we going to define wealth? And how are we going to define happiness in a marriage? So that is both the identification of the variables, wealth, marriage satisfaction, let's say, and then we have to go a step further, operationally define those, how are we going to measure those? We need numbers. We need numbers for these things. So how am I going to measure wealth and how am I going to measure marital satisfaction if I want to do that study? So this chapter starts off, you know, a little tape measure. We always, how do we measure things? And then uh, for learning outcomes we're going to be getting to get right into it defining those variables now think of the word variable is the thing that changes it varies okay and then we look at two kinds there's the independent variable and then there's the dependent variable and the independent variable in a classic experiment is the thing we change it's the things that we move around so if we're going to have two groups we're going to look at you know uh, the effectiveness of PowerPoint on learning, we're going to manipulate the independent variable of the presentation, the actual presence of the presentation. One group gets it, one group doesn't. And we're going to measure the dependent variable, which is the grades they got on the test. That will be the same at the end. If I went back to my example of marriage and happiness, I mean wealth and happiness, wealth is, we would have wealth as a measure, and we're looking to see if that causes happiness or not. Now, of course, that would be a correlation assignment to begin with. You know, we would look at, we would look at the variables and say, okay, I'm interested in wealth, and then does it relate to uh, marriage satisfaction? Do they go up and down together? So more wealth, more happiness? as a positive correlation, or do they have a negative correlation, which means as wealth goes up, marriage happiness goes down. As wealth goes down, marriage happiness goes up. It has an opposite relationship. We can still be looking at the correlation. We're just looking at the relationship. We can then still take it to that next level and design an experiment about that to see if there really is a causal relationship between wealth and marital happiness. So that's a little bit about variables, a little bit about um, you know dependent and independent variables. I'll go over this example right here, the theory of planned behavior. We'll use that as an example to look at the independent variables and dependent variables. Because in a model like this, there are like attitude, because there's a because there's two arrows, attitude and subjective norms, they depending on which direction you want to go. Okay, say you want to go to, uh, you can study the effect of attitude on norms, or you can study the effect of norms on attitudes. You see how it can go both ways. So that can be an independent variable or a dependent variable. This, the one-way arrow in this model determines that this is a independent variable, and it determines intention. Now this is a multi-factor variable. Intention is influenced by all three of these. You can see the way the arrows go. Okay, so attitude, subjective norm, and behavioral control all contribute. So these are all independent variables, how they relate to intention and ultimately to behavior. So I'll be using that as an example when we meet to talk about the different um, ways in which we define variables. 
Then we go into scales of measurement. We just discussed this in statistics last week, looking at nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio data and how that determines the way we actually measure things and the kind of statistics that we're going to use. We get into some methodological ways of dealing with reliability. Can your measure, you know, if you're doing a measure, let's say you're looking at behavior on the class, in the in the playground and you have three people that are, you know, every time they're observing and they're counting how many times somebody bops somebody on the head or steals a toy or something like that. And are all of your people that are collecting data, are they, are they collecting it in the same way? If you ever take the behavior management class, one of the things that we focus on in the behavior management class is a rule by which we define the behaviors that we're looking at. Now, the behaviors themselves are variables. And in behavior management, we're looking at what, vari what, what factors influence a person's behavior. It's classic experimental design. So is little Billy acting out because he doesn't understand what's going on? Or is little Billy acting out because he's trying to impress his friends? And we may, depending on how we want to intervene in that particular situation, we have to determine which one is it. Now, to do that, however, we have to determine what does acting out mean so we can make sure we measure it every time. And in behavior management, we define those very, very clearly. And one of the criteria, there's two criteria, two models that we use. One is called the... Um, stranger test. Now the stranger test that we use when we're analyzing our description of the behavior says anybody can walk, the way we have it described, anybody can walk off the street and they can, they can determine very accurately that Bill, when Billy's engaged in that behavior. So it's not throwing a fit, which can mean different things to different people. It's precisely defined scientifically so anybody could do it. That relates to here. When we look at the way we define how we, how we measure something, if we test it again or different people test it, do we get the same results? And that's a way that we can build that into our methodology to, deter, to make sure that we're always just getting the data that we want and we don't have any extraneous data leaking in as if we had, you know, maybe one of our three observers is really really overextending, you know, what they think a bop on the head is, you know, and they just do a tap on their head friendly and she goes, ah, oh, they just bopped him on the head. So she ends up with a lot more check marks. And so that, if you compare the different testers, you would see a discrepancy in the inter-rater reliability and we'd probably kick that person off the study. So we have uh, Bias, we're going to look at confounding variables, experimental bias, these are things that can come in. The effects of the actual testing environment, if we're going to do that, you know, what is, what, what about the environment might be impacting your results? These are all things that we take into account before we're doing our study and try to, try to um, take care of them. And then there's bias in the actual design, or is our, is our, the way we actually conduct the study and we'll have some discussions about this when we look at your study. Does the actual design tend to lead to particular certain responses? And I'm going to be showing you some. Ex I'll be showing some examples of that when we meet, or talking about some examples of that when we do meet. That brings us to a quiz and a lab. Uh, quiz and two labs for chapter five. So you have to define and distinguish. Define and distinguish. That means not just the definitions. It's a compare contrast assignment, you know, basically that you, you use the definitions of each to talk about how they're different and the same from one another. So make sure you, you're def, you include the definitions and a brief discussion about how they're similar and how they're different. That's a comparison contrast. That's what a teacher is looking for when they say comparison and contrast. And then we have two labs, lab 16 and lab 18. Of course, we'll be, we'll be going over reviewing the expectations for those labs on Monday. And um, you'll know, we'll start the class with a, I'll be asking how did the labs go for this week? And then uh, we can review those if possible. And then at the end of the class, we'll review the current labs for both chapters four and five. So looking forward to Monday. Sorry, this was a little long. I ended up to, I wanted to really shorten the videos for this, but maybe hearing me say this over and over helps. I don't know. So um, I'm not going to do that experiment. 
So uh, I will see you on Monday. Have a have a. I'm doing this on Saturday. Have a great. I hope you had a great weekend, and I look forward to Monday.